he was a really good case. He's the I think he's a, a really good type of case that it's it'd be nice to see like if someone was to like walk into your practice and say, well, what are you guys going to do on day one? I don't know. Well, shit, I might have you do 135 from blocks because <laughs> that's basically right. what happened. <laughs> That, that's a, that ended up what happened. You're listening to the Restoring Human Movement podcast, where movement experts discuss the latest evidence-based practices to help you and your clients move with mastery. And now, your host, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez. Hey, hey everyone. This is Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez, your host with the Restoring Human Movement podcast. Thanks for joining the movement movement. We also have the co-host, Dr. Cody D- 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 D-Mac. How's it going, everybody? What's up? You got a new microphone over there. I do, I do. I had it last time, I think, yeah. But I got a new stand, new setup, though, so it's a little bit, it's more hands-free, so it's a little bit a little bit better. Yeah, I think you look better this time, too. For some reason, that microphone made your haircut look better. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, changed the setting, I changed the settings on my headphones, too, so it maybe changed the shape of my head. Oh, do you end up having, like, the, I can see yours, or... They both kind of cut across the top around the alfalfa would be. Do you have a cut in after you're done? Uh, I do. I do. It's okay. Good. So okay. what we're going to cover this time is, uh, let's see what the t- what was the title I made here. Uh, it was General Strength Conditioning Recommendations uh, for, um, I know we were talking about uh, conditions that will tolerate uh, loading, I think. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Let me look this thing up. I'm not prepared. The... Okay, the title was Strength Conditioning Benefits for Aches and Pains, and just kind of presenting the just some thoughts or thought-provoking things that will get patients as well as clinicians to think about loading their patients and ways to frame the loading process and resistance training so the person actually wants to do it. Yeah, so I mean, it's really common for people not wanting to load anything once they get injured, you know? And so like a very common, the common... uh um, thought process is that old, uh, uh, rice, you know? Yeah. Have they, they've gotten away from that now, though, I think, right? Some, some people still use it. Uh, but I, I think, I don't think they necessarily, uh, understand that, you know, um, uh, you know, general movement's good too, but sometimes actually loading the, 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 the tissue itself is a, is, can be therapeutic. Mm-hmm. It is very therapeutic. And I, I know that with, uh, hopefully if the scheduling goes well, Last week, people would have already heard me interview Guido, and he would have talked about attractor states probably. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Guido's amazing, man. He's awesome. Yeah. I started off uh, the introduction with, uh, on the written part, is why is Guido a badass? (laughs) I don't think you have enough time for that. (laughs) Yeah. He's he's just a badass, man. He is so good at what he does, and he speaks, you know, he's so good at presenting too. He has material, and it just comes across so clean. It's awesome. Yeah, he's great. Now, um, I guess before we start here, then, are you aware that actually today is the release date to the book that I put out that actually you are in it too? Yeah, yeah. I saw the copy you sent over. Uh, it was good. You you, know, thanks you, for the uh, for the, the ball cap tip there. Yeah, you, you didn't get the uh, the print version yet. I think those are still coming. Uh, they, they should be ready now. This is the release date is January 16th is when this is going to release. Awesome. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it, I, I, I can't believe I said what I said in there, though. So. <laughs> I can't, wait, do you remember saying that or no? No, I, I don't remember. I think I remember you asking me that question. I don't believe it was 15%. Don't yeah. Be that. Yeah. Unless I was, I was like, I was totally pulling your chain, you know? I know. Well, I was sitting there. I was like, hmm. Okay. What else? <laughs> so is he, is he being serious? Or is he... <laughs> <laughs> so, so everyone, in case, uh, so. Uh, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So the book is basically called I Will Beat Back Pain, um, and it's kind of a precursor intervention book for when when you want someone to actually read a good book or go into therapy, like read McGill's Back Mechanic or, or uh, some of the McKenzie work. Like sometimes they just don't do it. So uh, what Cody's mentioning is that there's a section in there where um, it was kind of like uh, we, were, we were drinking beers at the bar. I remember we were at Pizza Lounge. I think we were, in your little, you were in your little corner spot. Um at the bar because you like to harass the bartenders. Um, and and I, I think we had a bunch and of beers. 
Go in, ahead. A, in a good in a good way in a good way yeah <laughs> they, were, they were all they were all friends we knew everybody there so well they were male bartenders too you didn't always yeah. harass the um, it was a nice it was a nice restaurant just to give the uh the lowdown to everybody it wasn't a, a hole in a wall bar or dark bar or anything like that it was actually a really good place yeah definitely not scabies there <clears throat> um nope. yeah so that then i eventually asked you i think we we're we we're talking about cases that worked and didn't work and i was like how much do you think you know about back pain that i the how much do you know that i know about back pain or what's the percentage you think that i know and you said 15 <laughs> <laughs> percent and I was like, "Motherfucker! Wait a minute. What do we, what do we got to learn here?" I, may, I maybe said f- fifty or or something like that, just to pull your chain. But but it got the wheels turning, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I dug around this in, into some things, and so some of the things that uh, uh, and I'm actually re- uh, just just for context here, I'm really not that cocky or anything like that. <laughs> you know, actually, funny. Um, so <clears throat> Brennan has been coming in, right? And uh, so me and Allie have been talking with Brennan, and I would just like to pull his chain every once in a while so we at right now we have this game called cocky or confident mm-hmm. so he'll ask a question and then i'll used to say something and it's just kind of like well that was cocky i'm like well was it confident we don't know <laughs> there's a fine line there yeah yeah you danced the line yeah well so so in that book then we go through the story of later on i end up having a back issue that was years later and i went to you as the one that managed it and yep. it kind of goes to the story of the, the mental foundation you have to build to be able to let rehab stick because back pain like mentally fucks people up, um, yep. and me inclusive too. So yeah, that's that book. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I think the the kind of mental approach or the uh, the kind of the I guess now you know people call it motivational interviewing approach uh, that the practitioner should participate into with the. Uh, the patient and you know letting them know they can they can beat the condition you know is is um it's, it's kind of overlooked you know a lot of people take too much of a straight biomechanic um approach but a lot of people don't take any biomechanic approach at all either so i think there's a line you 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 kind of dance between between the two you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know um in the just kind of framing things like i was i was thinking about how to to figure out how to to relay to people that there is that beginning interventional part that mental part that you kind of have to play the line with it also too with there's that barrier that people seem to not want to do the things suggested to them for whatever reason their bias their fears whatever the hell it is um and i was thinking of physics i was thinking inertia and friction we can push them but they don't tend to roll Mm-hmm. So, and I was thinking that with the book, the the book is intended to reduce friction, but someone has to push the book on them, right? So, yeah, buy, that's good. Buy for your spouse. I like it. <laughs> it's yeah. good stocking stuffer for, for next year. Oh, it is totally. Yeah, we're past that now. Maybe for Valentine's Day. Oh, I think I'm losing you right now. Valentine's Day. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah honey, I love you. You know, you, be back pain. you know what you could do, Valentine's Day, you could include McGill's study on uh, back positions or uh, spine positions with sex, <laughs> with coitus. <laughs> well, you, you can actually bring on Natalie Sidorkowitz, who did that, uh, who um, who actually, that was her study. And she, do you, have you met Natalie? No. She's awesome. She's fantastic. So her and uh, Carrie Tull, they, uh, they've created a company called, uh, it's named Red, Um and they're I mean, obviously they're based out of Canada, but they uh, they host a lot of seminars. So they've host uh, like McGill's uh, the uh, the McGill Summit. They hosted the McGill Summit, so they uh, they do a really good job at hosting seminars too. No, oh, cool. No, never never met him. I never been to Can. Oh, I've been to Canada one time. Yeah, we've uh, um, we've been to well, Marianne, my wife, has been to Calgary to assist uh, uh, Craig Liebenson. And both her and I have been to Vancouver, uh, Vancouver multiple times to assist Craig Levinson up there too. And that's what Red Red hosted uh, Craig up there. They let you into Canada, huh? They did. They did. So why are you here? It's a business and pleasure. <laughs> well, so let's get into strength conditioning then. I think uh, let me let me start out with. Uh, I know that when like my experience with exposing some of my patients to. I guess just picking up a weight in general, because I know I had a lady recently, she was, she's 85, and she came in, and she's, uh, 
I want her to do a little bit of caring work, you know, because she's going to have to encounter yeah. groceries and whatnot. And she's like, I don't want to pick that up. And I only gave her a 10 pounder and she kept giving it back, you know. And mm-hmm. she's, then she took two pounders eventually and she started walking with those and started swinging them. And I was thinking, swinging them, you're probably subjecting yourself to a lot more force than this 10 pound carry. But, right. e- but either way, she was hesitant of it. Um, mm-hmm. So I think the stereotype with, with picking up a weight is that it's an exercise. It's not a implement to improve the person's ability to move weight mm-hmm. through life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, people under, need to understand that, you know, human bio, body is a very robust, uh, uh, th- thing, you know, and it's not some fragile flower, uh, and, and actually loading it is very beneficial. You're not going to create any change or adaptation to, um, to at all, unless you apply stress and, you know, that external load or that, uh, that implement is the stress and it can create a positive change. Uh, too little is not good and too much is not good. So mm-hmm. there is a sweet spot, you know, and, and, and just kind of moving people towards the middle of that, uh, that spectrum in terms of, uh, load, uh, loading tissues is, is kind of our idea. And that, that, that well, that's what we were trying to do with rehab, right? Mm-hmm. Before we hand them off to the strength and conditioning coach. Yeah. And I think at least most people are very familiar with the idea that, especially of a certain age, they're probably thinking osteoporosis, you know, things of that nature. And their their doctors at least said, hey, you take these vitamins and then start doing weight-bearing exercise and pick up a weight every once in a while. Um, And when you say the the adaptation of of tissues, that's inclusive of bone, tendon, ligament, uh, cartilage, and a lot of things, even nervous system, right? Um, Right. So when... Is there a certain is there a certain conversation you have with people when when they're they're hesitant of actually picking up a weight or? Well, I think uh, you know educating them on uh, you know that we're not going to ask them to pick up uh, if they've never picked up a weight before it's been a long time or they they're they're old and they're afraid um, you know t- letting them reassuring them that we're not going to pick up two hundred pounds you know this is this is not something that's going to break them down let them know this is actually going to be good in the long run. Uh, they should not have discomfort uh, when they do certain, uh, you know, if we start to do certain loads, you know, and um, and for them to communicate with us and let them know that we're there uh, if we if there needs to be any help. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually that's a good point with making sure that they are aware that when you say pick up a weight, you're not talking about making them into a Olympic weightlifter or a power nope. lifter. Not at all. Um, and. I know that there is like, is there a general recommendation? Do you give people in regards to like, um, are you like, what is a good long term goal for you, just as a human being, to be able to like move certain types of weights? Well, I think it it totally depends on on the person's goals and also the person's training age. You know, so I mean, if you have somebody who has literally never lifted weights before uh, ever, then I don't think your goal for them and they're in, you know, they're, they're in their sixties or something like that. I don't think your a goal for them necessarily is going to be a uh, very high load, you know, just getting, just getting, you know, once you hit, start to get the 60 range, 60 years old, just building, uh, you know, building muscles in uh, through hypertrophy training is very, very beneficial for longevity. So I think the, the goals may change a little bit, you know, now if you have somebody who's, who started training when they were, you know, a teenager, and they've kept training all the way through, you know, and now they're 60. Um, they're going to, ha- you're going to have very different, uh, uh, different exercises, different loads for that person. And, it, and but it's still centered around their goals and what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I to- I totally agree. Um, and I tell people that probably like one of the, one of the main reasons why I think that I'm in business is actually when there's big peaks in their, in their loading or their mileage or whatever they want to, to call their exercise or their high intensity training. Um, mm-hmm. those big peaks that they have are, um, just a little bit more risky than, than I would want them to. Cause they're, I think they're in a bigger rush to get to their fitness goals or whatever it might be rather than just taking a long, good long-term approach. Right. So, yeah, there's no, there's no shortcuts to that. Right. Uh, you know, if we're talking about, uh, just kind of keeping, trying to keep things, uh, healthy, so to speak, just tissues in terms of, uh, uh, not overloading them if they're some type of endurance athlete, or even if the, you know, even if they're like a bodybuilder and their programming is, is kind of poor and they don't get, uh, allow for adequate rest periods, they're going to start to have issues and it's going to really, it, it'll hinder their training. Yeah. Um, just my observation with like, 
I don't know if it's just me or the people that I follow on social media. It's just a bunch of Cairo meatheads lifting weights and stuff. <laughs> um, but I feel like there's a push for people to get people into Olympic uh, barbell lifting. Mm-hmm. Is uh, what do you think about that? Like, I mean, again, it depends. You know, what's the person's training age? Has the person ever done it before? You know, if you have a 45-year-old male who's never done Olympic lifting before and he has really, really bad, sh- like just kind of worn out shoulders, bad T-spine, uh, I don't think – I think certain parts of Olymp- Olympic weightlifting can be very beneficial. Uh, but looking back on the goals, you know, are they are they trying to be an Olympic lifter or yeah. are they participating in a sport that could benefit from Olympic weightlifting? Uh, are you trying to use the uh, uh, Olympic lifting as a metabolic conditioning uh, exercise? Then that's a problem, too. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not really meant for that. So again, it kind of d- totally depends, you know, I mean, um, you know, what kind of person do you think, do you have in mind? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just kind of curious with, it. by the way, I would consider myself a meathead. So don't, uh, don't take offense to that. There's, uh, the, by the way, I was thinking too, that with the, with, you imagine like there's the, like, I've had a lot of people come in with like, so I'll have them carry kettlebells. I'll have them, hold on to barbells, hold, hold on to these objects that have like nice round handles sometimes. And there's a couple times where I've told them, uh, you know what you should do? Just go to your garage, pick up that old Jansport backpack, a couple of them that I know you don't use and you had since high school. And since it has a lifetime warranty, you're never going to get rid of it. And, <laughs> and fill it up with a bunch of shit in your garage you don't actually use and walk around the neighborhood with it. And they're like, well, why shouldn't I just, maybe I'll just buy a kettlebell. I'm like, you want to pay 170 a pound for a kettlebell when realistically <laughs> in life, it's never going to have a nice round handle like that. Like yeah. it's, it's always, you're always picking up random shit. Like you're just coming up the stairs from Costco carrying two boxes and then like a jug of milk, you know? Yeah. Well, that was part of my training is, uh, when I, when I would move the kettlebells around my office is I would put the 24 kilo around my, uh, wrap my index finger around that. And then the 20 kilo around my middle finger. And I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you were going to say it. you would, you would bear hug one like a baby's head <clears throat> and the other one yeah. you would, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it, stack them all in the hand and start pressing them. No, I think, uh, you know, creating a little bit of variability, like that's important also, you know, and, and, uh, and the fitness industries, uh, swung, uh, really far towards, um, uh, variability and implements. So, you know, whether that's a kettlebell sandbag, uh, bands, barbell, dumbbell, I mean, you, you name it, it's out there. Right. So, uh, it's a good thing. It also, you know, we can't deny the basics, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't move too far from what, you know, what, what definitely works, but the variability is, is, is something that's important. You know, it's just like people who, um, you know, distance runners, one of the things you might give them is, you know, like you're, you're in Huntington beach, you might tell them, Hey, take your shoes, your shoes off, your socks off. Uh, just go walk in the beach nice and slow just so they get some different feedback coming up through their feet into their nervous system. You know, Mm -hmm. just that alone might be therapeutic to them. Mm Mm-hmm. On that same note, what do you think about lifting gloves? Uh, I'm not a lifting <laughs> glove guy, but I mean, you know, but, but let's, but let's be, you know, if you're a, what if you're a hand model? Yeah, right. Well, does, yeah, but you do know, you ever see, do you ever see hand models go like this palm, palm to the camera? They're usually the other way. They they usually are, but you never know <laughs> what, what type of shoot you're going to get as a hand model. You're right. I, there's, I think there's a good niche market for selling yeah. uh, weightlifting gloves to hand models. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was, I was, I was just curious because of the uh, the feedback, the afferent feedback. But yeah, um, I know I have a, I have a friend who grew up in Boston and he didn't have much money as a kid, and he would have a little cellar over there, and he'd go downstairs with all of his buddies, and they didn't have much money, so he was just like lifting all of the rusty like iron there was that he could find. But for the most part, he had a lot of center blocks. So he'd just be yeah. pressing center blocks. That's cool. That's like, that's easy shit. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you ever made an anchor out of concrete. Right. That's the easy I, I way. Haven't. Yeah, but, yeah, it's the easy way, yeah. Really? I have. They don't work very well because they don't grab the bottom of the leg too well. <laughs> <laughs> we just use anchors. Yeah. Well, those sand, have you, damn. It depends on the bottom, Okay. You can get those like claw looking ones. You get the wedge ones. If you yeah. have if you have a variable bottom leg, you need different types of anchors, really. Yeah, well, everything was in the bayou or the uh, or surrounding swamp areas where I'm from, South Louisiana. So uh, we it, we just use an an anchor. So you would, so we just use something that would hook to a Cajun. Uh, uh, no, 
No, Wait, no. what do you call the crocodiles? Are they Cajuns? The crocodiles? I thought the... Co- Wait, no. What? No, there's alligators down there. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, so one salt, salt and... There's no crocodiles down there. So the... You're talking wait. about bra- the water? The brackish water? Okay, educate me on crocodiles versus alligators. I, 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 I don't know what you're talking about right now. No, they, they're, they're just... They're, they're different. So they have a different... Uh, the, the nose is shaped differently and the teeth are, are different. Too, you, have, so. you have those round... The ones that look like double rainbows, right? Uh, yeah, I mean it's a little bit more wider and round at the end. The crocodile is a little bit more narrow. It's not like a inverse parabola. No, no, like no, a high slope all. parabola. No, Good. back to uh, loading. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, is there any times where you would, if someone walked in, just we should actually probably get into a little bit of a more case presentation, I guess. But yeah. um, is there any times where someone will walk in where you're like, I'm not going to use uh, loading on this person right now, of any type. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. What if you suspect something's broken? Okay. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a, that's a pretty clear, you know, obvious answer, but I mean, uh, I don't know, you know, if, if, if uh, there are no, um, no red flags, so to speak, and then, you know, you're not suspecting some type of fracture, you know, or, or some gross ligament, uh, or joint instability, then, I mean, I think loading at the right time, right place, uh, and the right way may be beneficial and or not necessarily take away their pain, but could be uh, uh, fairly therapeutic in mm-hmm. the long run. So. I, I tend to think if there's, I feel like there's an acute first aid process there, I won't necessarily load them yet. But if they're yeah. kind of at the tail end of that, I might try with some attractor state yeah. stuff. But if it right. flares them up, then I'll yeah. retract real quickly. Right, right. So, you know, I, I, I'm with you on that too. You know, and, but I also look at, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's non load on the tissue that's irritated, but can we load somewhere else to take off some, uh, some stress of that area? Um, you know, you exp- a, a great, yeah, a great example of that, you know, somebody who come in with uh right knee pain, uh, whether that's kind of, you know, kind of patellar tendon and, or kind of just some, uh, medial knee pain and you put them through a squat and looking at them from the front, they're start, they're shifting into the right side. Mm-hmm. And maybe maybe their knee is coming in the valgus. Maybe it's not coming in the valgus, but they have pain with that. But there's an obvious shift to the side. So looking at taking a step back and say, okay, what what is making this person shift into the side of pain? So you look at the pain that does. Uh, the, I mean, excuse me. You look at the side that doesn't hurt. That's not in pain. So maybe you do an evaluation, and uh, let's say they you have some some left hip thing going on, whether that's decreased range of motion or you're, you, you're suspecting that, uh, they're not, so the brain's not wanting to use that side for some reason. Uh, you might put them through an exercise to what, you know, cre- increase the attractor state in the glute on the left side, not the right side on the left side. And then you re-squat them and now they're, they're more symmetrical in the squat and the pain, the pain's gone away in the right knee. That's but all so- you've done is, is you increase the attractor state on, on the opposite side, uh, and change the movement pattern. And so the one area is not being overloaded. So we didn't load necessarily the, the, the tissue that's irritated, but we've loaded something else. Um, and so you've loaded the patient and you get, now they have an exercise they can take at home. Yeah. And also too, I think that if they're like in that situation, if they're loading the side of the complaint Mm -hmm. and they're offloading the other, then if we're going to take this person in the, in a, in a good long-term direction, we have to equal that out anyways. So you might as well just start hitting it now. Yep. Um, I always like to consider, like, so at least working with, like, uh, the right corrective exercise or the, in the right dosage for that person at that time. And, mm-hmm. and I think that if you can find that, which t- sometimes takes me three, four times to figure out what exercise works. And if I have a reset on them, it's nice. Um, yeah. But once you do that, you can make a good change in about a minute or so. And then yeah. how long it sticks is a whole different story. Yeah. I mean, I think, well... With the, you know, it's a great point in terms of it sticking, you know, so a lot of people do uh, exercises to fire up their glutes or fire up specific muscle groups. I mean, you have to load that with some type of load and in, in, in hopes that we have some carryover in long term. So people will get their glutes fired up, you know, if they do some band walks, uh, but then they don't really do anything. And so, you know, it would, if your goal for that for that exercise, those band walks is to strengthen the glutes. You're not strengthening the glutes. You're just increasing the attractor state in the, in the muscle group. 
But if you load that with a deadlift or a single leg deadlift, some type of load in a pattern, uh, ideally that, that, you know, I, a, it makes the, the uh, exercise a little bit more efficient with some, uh, some increased attractor state in the area and B we have some carryover for, uh, for longevity in terms of strength. So then considering that same play case, it's probably easy to, to follow down this knee case a little bit. So, um, imagine we have that same case and we did increased, uh, the, I would say supportive system, supportive areas, and then, and it helps reduce the symptoms and we can get them to some type of, uh, loaded movements. Is it fair to say that that knee person, we might hinge them or deadlift them? And you said single leg, deadlift them, maybe have them carry, maybe yeah. have them do a pull. Squat might be higher risk. Yeah, maybe. Uh, what, what type of squat, you know? Uh, it may, maybe maybe you go, if they have pain in the bilateral squat, maybe you go to a split squat or and you only have them do like a quarter split squat and you expose to them that they, they don't have any discomfort and you go back to the, the bilateral squat. I think it kind of totally depends. You, you There's this... Like you said, that you might it may take you two to three visits to find this find the things uh, the exercises so to speak. But I mean, I think also it's exposing to that person what patterns don't hurt and um, trying to find the ones that they're afraid to do, and then giving them variations or regressions on those exercises to load those tissues and then take a step back and say, hey, we just loaded these tissues that you you're scared of loading in this pattern. Do you want to try and load this pattern now? Um, and some take you up on that some of them don't. Um, but the ones who do take it up on it, that, you know, they don't always, uh, they're not always pain-free when they load those, but, uh, most of the time it's less discomfort, yeah. Yeah. especially once you, you, you kind of, you, you pull the curtain back, you're like, Hey, surprise, we loaded the things that you're afraid to load. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I think that, um, when, when loading them too, it's, uh, it's nice to have patients to, to have a little bit of understanding of that just because it's painful to squat doesn't mean we can't go a percentage of that depth and go as much as you can and then slowly expose yourself to it or maybe expose yourself to that same range in a, um, a quad table, quad rock tabletop position or some yeah. type of regression. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, so um, yeah, I think that's a good recap on the yeah. new thing there but yeah i think you were telling me earlier before we came on that you had a really good uh example of uh when load became therapeutic for a patient yeah um there's actually there was a lady last night there was uh she was she was kind of fun she came in and uh she had uh left-sided upper trap i guess you would say um tightness or not it's she said mm-hmm. as she said and, and also some mid-back stuff um, it was more of a more of like a sensation of tightness in the area. Um, she couldn't really validate that or not, but she can show me movements that were provocative, like a a, a partial push up. Um, granted, her push up was the, the the form being taught was not what I would have wanted. Uh, well, actually, she was like this. Yeah, she, she was like so really, el- elbows were really far out. Yeah, and probably. she she actually had her index fingers pointed inward. Hmm. So it was inter- it was interesting. So we cleaned that up a little bit. She still had some provocative symptoms, and also also the area around the uh, what's this area called right there? It, there's I know there's a gully there that actually has a name. Yeah, I don't remember it. To be honest with you, kind of just so everybody knows, he's pointing just medial to the uh, uh, the humerus, the anterior portion of the humerus, so like, kind of where the pec pec minor ties into uh, coracoid. Right, so she did say she had some pec minor um, pain, and then uh, upon further questioning, we figured out it was actually like a, a zapping, numbing type of sensation. Oh. So, um, but either way, though, so um, I wanted to see first if we can supply some type of load to the area because in testing, um, I, I had she had problems with moving her neck, so moving her neck to that side, tilting, and also looking up were, were painful. So I had her with that same arm, same side arm that she was tilting to and had problems with. I just had her, I said, push me away, you know, lock the mm-hmm. elbow out and push me away. Move the head again. Yeah. Let's just see how you feel. And she's like, oh, it feels better. And I'm like, cool, great. So I, then I had her push her elbow into me, elbows by the side, and I had pushed down towards the table really hard. And I said, yeah. how's that feel? And she said, oh my God, it's better. What, what is this, some type of shitty voodoo, you know? <laughs> and so I, t- I took her out into the floor area and we did some attractor state stuff with the uh, middle trap, lower trap. Uh, I first tried like serratus type of like a, an aggressive pushing position because she led yeah. me down the route of a push up. Um, yeah. That one was kind of iffy. The, but when we did lower trap, middle trap, she sat up and she's like, 
I'm purring like a kitten. This is this is so good. So I didn't have to. I didn't do any manual therapy with her in that case. Um, right. I might later, but mm-hmm. that was the instant where actually um, she. I think her 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 belief system changed. It. She's like, I had no idea we we're going to do this today. And right. I had her sweating on the ground and only took about a minute and a half to get her to that point. But now she just has yeah. to stick it a little bit. And then we, we did a carry after that. We did uh, 16 kilos per hand. Oh, sorry, 12 kilos per hand. And she was hesitant and she was talking during which. And so I increased it. And then she stopped talking. And then she she uh, she felt fine after that. So then at that point, I can relate to her trainer that I'm like, she's responding well to carries. She's responding well to some type of lower middle trap type of thing. And let's just carry on with that and just see what else reveals itself But as we unmuddy the water. Yeah. That was my case. No, that's great. I mean, I think, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times patients don't realize that, you know, uh, loading too will be therapeutic to that. They're, they're expecting, uh, you know, I think we've talked about this before, you know, they're expecting come in for you to, to only put your hands on them and do some type of soft tissue, you know, massage ART or some type of instrument assisted soft tissue and maybe adjust them, you know, but, um, you know, they don't understand that our goal is to try and find things that they can do at home to, uh, you know, to create some independence from us. You know, terrible business model, but you know, in terms of patient care, it's it's optimal. Yeah, yeah, and and I think as long as we, um, I always try to make sure that I, I I I understand what you hear that like you said you had upper trap knots and so on because they would probably believe that then beating the snot out of it would be a good first approach to it. And so I say, look, l- let's try this other stuff first, but we we can still do that other stuff later, and we could. Mm-hmm. But these are things that you're showing me that, like in the exam, you can see it. If you do some type of dynamic test or loading in the exam, you'll see if it makes a change or not. Mm -hmm. And then you can probably see, too, with low risk, where you can start loading this person. Yeah. Just curious, did you have her do any type of overhead pressing? Did I have her do overhead pressing? Yeah. Um, I didn't because usually I'll ask them, like, what can duplicate your symptoms? And whatever they go to that they can consistently create, I'll use that as the me- as the measurement outcome tool. Um, yeah. I-, I could go overhead with it, but at that point, um, I didn't see any point yet. Uh, she yeah. did have it flare up in the gym with overhead pressing, she said. Yeah. Um, uh, did you do any ne- uh, shock locks, neurodynamic stuff up for Shrimini? I did not there yet. Actually, she came in about 30 minutes late, and I had to, I had to get to what I needed to get to. So yeah, get to it. I, well, I started with some type of, uh, I started with neuroortho um, compression, mm-hmm. um, decompression testing of the cervical spine, which yeah. it bared fruit. But then also holding the blade together and stabilizing the blade seemed like it was bearing more fruit. So I just went that route and I'll probably change routes next time. Um, oh, yeah. I was, just, I was just curious to see if she had some, uh, some if you had some positive neurodynamic testing and then overhead press, she was having some lateral translation of the cervical, uh, of the head towards the side she was pressing. So um, I... I was thinking that actually when uh, I was testing her, but the the thing I was I was doing myotome testing, right? And she she yeah. did the uh, C five, yeah. this one, uh, the bicep yeah. one, and uh, she immediately went like like this, right? Yeah. And so I yeah. said, just just stop right there. I'm gonna go get my phone. We're gonna do a video, yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. she did the other side, and it was fine. With pushing, it was fine, um, but she I found enough to where I thought I could make an impression and make right. a difference in what she was trying. And then next time I would, I would, I would go through more. Um, right. I don't know. Personally, I like to, uh, I just tell them straight up. I'm like, look, I'm, I'm learning about you as a story and I can only get through so much today. I'm on a speed reader. So let's go through more next time. Yeah. A lot of times there's a, there's, there's, well, there's more to it, right. Than just the presentation that they're presenting with. So like, the, or the, the issue they're presenting with, you know, so there's, I mean, you don't know what they you don't know their the stress level at their job or or family at home and stuff. You know, <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. there's so many more factors to 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 the person itself, right? Yeah, it'll sound like probably like a, a like a shitty type of business scheme, but I think the best thing that we could do the first time is if we feel confident we can work with this person, improve them. You got to get them to come back because right. if, if they don't come back, you can't help them. Right. Um, do you have a good case about loading? I know you talked about the knee. I do. Yeah. The knee, I have another good one to have an upper extremity one. Also I was having somebody who, uh, who we, we suspected they, they had some type of uh cervical disc issue. They were having some radiculopathy. I mean, everything was pointing to a disc there, you know, cough, kind of coughing, sneezing, digerines triad, so to speak, uh, was positive. 
um, ortho, ortho testing, neuro testing was positive. Um, so, but they were, the pain in their arm they were having, was kind of over the deltoid and into the uh, lateral forearm. So, um, uh, exercise wise was like, okay, well, and I tested their grip, not with a dianonomometer, but just, uh, just had them squeeze my finger. I had put my fingers in their hands. I had them squeeze. Oh, and I, thought you had them, I always thought you had them squeeze your thighs for some reason. Creepy. No, they style. can't, they can't fit away <laughs> on my thighs. My thighs are too big, <laughs> too, too much muscle. Anyway. Um, I, the, the, and on the, the side that was, uh, he was having the pain. It just wasn't squeezing as hard as the other side. So I brought him into the rehab area and I had a CLX band. I didn't have a cable machine, but I have a CLX band. And I put a baseball um, in a uh, in one of the loops. And what I did was I had him grab half of the baseball uh, with his fingers together, anchoring the thumb first, and then going uh, pinky ring middle index. So kind of, almost kind of if you take your hand and you kind of bite your thumb and your fingertips together. You're doing like, like a, pat- you look like a crane. You look like a, a yeah. like a little crane tip so everyone knows. Yeah. And so, um, and so he only has half the baseball. So it, it actually, what it ends up doing is you're not, if the baseball is not in your palm, it's really half the baseball is since, uh, inside the fingers and half, half is out and I had him just put it in a, uh, unloaded in terms of the CLX band, put his, his, his arm in a road position. Like he would pull for a uh, standing row and I had him back up. So it just loaded the fingertips uh, and the, uh, and the hand, in that finished row uh, position and he cashed out really quick. I mean, the ball started sliding out immediately. And so long story short, kind of started building up to, he got, he get, it got more and more endurance, started having him row and then retest. Uh, and he, it, the sensation in his arm went away. So all the pain and discomfort in his arm completely went away. We didn't do anything with the neck. All we did was increase, um, I guess the brains, I guess the attractor state, so to speak, um, with the, uh, the pincer grip. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and my, I mean, it was, I should have, I should have had a dynamometer so I could give you some data, <laughs> but, but I had him squeeze again. It was, and to me, it was obvious that he, and he felt like he was able to squeeze a little bit more too. So, um, that was a great instance of that. So we went a grip route with this guy and we did some McKinsey, uh, chin, uh, you know, some retractions, some uh, neck retractions and stuff. Yeah. So, that was on, uh, that was a one day thing you're talking about. There was, are we talking about progressive or just one day? No, that was one day. That was, that was, um, that was basically that was first visit. I used that as an audit to see if that was going to be the thing. Cause in his exam, we did a movement exam too, and nothing really was pointing, uh, towards any other big, uh, big things. And, and even did, a um, upper, uh, cervical breakout SFMA and, you know, it's a motor control stuff in the, uh, cervical, uh, lower cervical. So, um, that's why we, we kind of went a little bit more, mm-hmm. uh, McKenzie route and, you know, if, if he did have some type of disc, you know, the, that whole McKenzie thing for a disc. Mm-hmm. So then with something like that, was, I don't know if the listeners will probably think, well, crap, I, I, I don't want to load this person too early. What if I do? Like, how do I mm-hmm. know? Um, so in a case like that, did you have some type of uh, reassurance that you're like, I'm not going to hurt this person? Yeah, well, well, that case specifically, they were okay with doing it because it, it wasn't their neck. They weren't really, uh, and it was just like a measly little band uh, and a baseball. So they didn't really know where I was going with the whole thing. And I told them what we're doing. I just told, and I just told them and say, Hey, we're going to do something for your grip right here. Um, and to them, their, their, uh, I'm putting air quotes, weak grip, so to speak, um, wasn't necessarily related to their neck. They didn't know why they didn't squeeze harder on that side. Did you, they, t- they did you even know. tell them or no? Uh, tell them what? Did you tell them? Did you even do? Oh, what, did I point it out to him whenever I noticed? Uh, when did, I, whenever he's did you did you mention the neck as being a as a correlating factor, or did they just you know like people like no matter how much you tell them about the neck yeah. or whatever it is, they're like, well, my wrist, and you're like, well, it's, it's not your wrist. Yeah, well, he he came in and he is he like I mean just like most patients they come in with their differential diagnosis right or or their diagnosis. So this guy came in with his differential was like I don't know if it's my shoulder or maybe even it's my neck, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he did he tried to do his research before he came in. Um, but so towards the end, I was like, yeah, I th- we, I'm pretty sure it's coming from your neck. We're going to do this, this, and this moving forward. Uh, and I want to see you again. I want you to do this until I see you again next week. And you know, it got better pretty quickly. I mean. Uh, most of the people that came in, um, you know, they, they weren't on long treatment plans or anything like that. And so they, they would do their homework, mm-hmm. you know, 
they're mm-hmm. paying for it out of pocket. They're going to do their homework. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You had you had the cash practice, so people uh, they they should do their things. They don't always though. <laughs> they don't always, but the most of the part they do. Most, yeah. yeah. Did um? Can you give me an example of a case that you perhaps? Because that was a light loading one. How about one yeah. where you where someone and <clears throat> a bystander might think, "Holy shit, you're doing that with an injured person." Yes. Well, I mean, if I can, I can count. I mean, I can't even begin to count how many times I've I've loaded lumbar like people where we suspect a lumbar disc and mm-hmm. either a deadlift or an isometric lifter's wedge. You know, mm-hmm. um, is it, it's, it's a it's an in visit progression. You, we don't immediately go to it, so to speak. But I mean, I mean, I'm sure that you've had this too. People barely walking in, and we suspect there's some type of lumbar disc, and we we progress them in a 30 minute visit from barely being able to walk to lifting weight off of a platform mm-hmm. or lifting weight off of a box, you know, and I, and that's you know, a, that's you know that's actually, an easy example. <laughs> you know, actually, um, for everyone that, uh, I don't know if this will be live by the time this podcast goes, I, I doubt it, but, um, there, so I flew out to see Cody recently in, in Dallas and we did a, a whole video series on, uh, flexion intolerant back pain, strength conditioning, basically. Uh, we went over the squat, the hinge, the carry, uh, progressions of all of them, as well as uh, horizontal pull. And we didn't do push, but that was my bad. Um, but anyways, this is going to be part of a CE course that we're putting on, uh, online CE course that uh, I'm part of. I'm doing ethics with Ben Ramos. Um, <laughs> Philip Snell, Greg Lehman, uh, and James... Uh, uh, Vacrocello is going to be on there as well. It's all flexion and tolerant pain. But, uh, in the reason I bring it up is because the, the person that we use as a model, he actually was a real case. Like he, we hadn't seen him before. You hadn't seen him before. No, no, I haven't treated. I had, I've never seen, met him before in my life. Didn't treat him. Didn't. Yeah. So, so, so you're going to see through, uh, just talk about that a little bit with, um, cause I know that we took him through you load them pretty good. Like I remember that when we went into the goblet squats, you were doing a double rack, and I think you you said go over there and pick up those sixty twos um, pounds. Yeah. By the way, I'm American. Pounds. Yeah. And, and uh, you were going to load them up with two of those, and uh, that was so. That's basically on day one of exposure to this guy. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 gentleman, I mean, he has been dealing with a uh, low back disc issue. I believe it was it was confirmed on MRI, um, and he uh he had taken some time off of lifting he's an olympic lifter uh non not necessarily competing but that's just what he does and he's a he's a coach also he's a strength coach so um we started to uh, i asked him before we started it was just, this was off air and i said hey you know, i asked him a bunch of questions his background what has he been doing for his rehab and treatment and whatnot um and he has, has did not start uh deadlifting did not start really squatting he started the front squat a little bit but it was very light i think with maybe maybe tens on the bar so that everything was pretty raw uh, uh, from get-go and i didn't i didn't tell him beforehand and say hey i want you to do this and then we hit record it was all just there do this and see what happens and then coach from there and i think that was the idea is mm-hmm. is being able to coach those individuals um uh taking them from somebody who's maybe competent in lifting like this guy was, but still have some movement pattern issues to somebody who's really has never lifted before um, and, and be able to coach them in those, uh, in those lifts. And it's just positions and patterns, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that was a, he was a really good case. He's the, I think he's a, a really good type of case that it's, it'd be nice to see like if someone was to like walk into your practice and say, well, what are you guys going to do on day one? I don't know. Well, shit, I might have you do 135 from blocks because <laughs> that's basically right. what happened. <laughs> that, that's a, that ended up what happened. Yeah, the guy, the guy's an animal. I mean, he he ended up uh, doing really well. He handled everything well, and I've seen him a couple times uh, in passing since uh, the recording, and I haven't told you this, and he feels amazing. He's starting to actually turn up the intensity on his training now, and he's using those techniques that we talked about uh, in the uh, – uh, and the recording, mm-hmm. uh, he's using the, he's, he's said he's never felt more locked in and the weights never felt more lighter than it has before by creating the tension through the grip and the, in the, in the floor. And then thinking about breaking the bar and everything he's, he said it, it's working really well for him. Yeah. Well, nice. He was cool. Like he, uh, yeah, like he, he was good a good, guy. definitely a good sport with, uh, cause we were recording for a bit. Um, yeah. and I just, uh, 
I know that one of the things is a precursor that we had in there, which I, I know that you teach before uh, you introduce people to heavier weights, at least, and I do as well, um, is hand contact and, and wedging. And yep. in that course, uh, we go through that. And I remember, actually, it was funny when, because I've been um, from the from the admin side of, of putting all these videos together with Greg's and Phil's and so on. And like, so I, like we were sitting there watching football and editing yours and, uh, yours were damn entertaining. Like watching <laughs> you show the lobster claw grip, grip to this guy. I'm like, I can't believe I'm watching a 10 minute video on grip. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is important. You know, it is important. Uh, it, and it could be, if you get to a certain level in terms of, uh, 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 competition, whether that's powerlifting, strength and conditioning, uh, you know, strongman comp- competition, uh, that can be the, the determining factor of whether or not you, uh, you hit the weight you want, you hit the lift you want, or, uh, you end up, you know, it, it, it's important. It is important. So, yeah. So if any of you, if any of you guys are hesitant of, of showing, uh, loading, especially, uh, barbell lifting, yeah. And to to your patients, uh, that course is going to be amazing. It's it's one of a kind so far. I've never seen anything like it, uh, at least from a CE perspective. But um, just to retract a little bit, because we talked about that he was an Olympic lifter, uh, we can clearly use those techniques with normal people, right? Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. You don't have to be uh, uh, an Olympic lifter. You don't have to be a power lifter. You don't have to be somebody who who works out for a living. I mean, the general population, the, the same exact thing, the same thing I go over with my, uh, my strongman competitors or power lifters. It's this, I do the same material with my general population because it's, you know, in the long run, it's all about creating tension, you mm-hmm. know, and being able to manipulate your tension, control your nervous system, knowing when to contract and when to be able to, uh, to relax. I was really surprised by when, um, the since he was uh, an Olympic lifting coach, that the grip was so uh, inspiring to him, and that wedging was so like it, it was it was like a, it was like a crazy like he said he was totally locked in. So it was mm-hmm. clearly something that he was lacking um, in in his movements, and especially if he's coaching it, um, mm-hmm. I can only imagine how many people like I, actually I can't tell you how many times like actually I came from Guido's workshop and went straight yeah. over to a friend's house afterwards. And uh, they, uh, we got all crazy watching football and so on. I said, "Lay on the ground, let's do some of this shit." And so uh, we're just just yelling, <laughs> screaming at them, and because they go they go to CrossFit over here locally. And uh, since yeah. then, I have stopped going to to that gym because I have my own. Yeah. And uh, they're like, they're like, I love when you come over because you always uh, like. We'll t- I'll tell them how to wedge in the floor. I'll say, "Go in your garage and go grab a go grab a bar. Let's fucking do this thing." And so yeah. they start using it. Like I don't know how many beers they have, but they probably start, they start using it right away <laughs> and they love it. Yeah. yeah. It's good stuff. I mean, and, and I, I tell this to, especially, you know, I tell this to everybody, you know, we're going to go over this, these, these, uh, tensioner techniques and how to, you know, create pretension before you actually start to create tension into the lift. Um, we're going to do that, uh, in the beginning, whenever we're rehabbing and we may do that whenever we're starting to warm up with a, uh, you know, an empty bar or lightweight. But when you start going high maximal loads, you're not going to be thinking about all this stuff. You know, it, this, these are things to think about and do, uh, in the beginning. And then we want them to transition over. We want it to be, uh, uh unconscious competence at that, at that point, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, just to, just to make sure I, I finish up on this. If you guys uh, are interested in that CE course, it will be available year after year. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes uh, and uh, in the and in your media player. You'll find a little link right there. It, it might not be live yet because we're still in the process of developing all of the um, all the content and getting approved through the schools. So you can always do twelve hours on there. That's there's four hours of documentation as well as history taking, which everybody needs, uh, as well as two hours of uh, ethics. Which, by the way, me, when me and Ben did it, holy shit, it was it was tough. It was so <laughs> so hard. Ethic. Ethics is tough to make interesting, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, so we went over case presentations of, you know, people, um, yeah. the uh, NCMIC, but it was, 
it was every time, like we went through about three cases and we're like, okay, we need to go eat. Uh, I, I don't want to touch a person ever again because I'm scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, man. So you're talking about CEs for that course. Is that uh, chiropractic CEs or are there any other CEs or no? No, those are just, chiro- they're going to be chiropractic for now. And uh, I know that um, we'd spoken to uh, Stuart McGill about taking, uh, about doing some stuff on there as well. Kind of the, uh, uh, yeah, so so Philip might, and, and I don't know if it's 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 truly going to happen or not yet, but he might interview uh, Stu on some of the stuff he's observed through his uh, adventures with working with people, and just wasn't enough to publish really. So they might spend a twelve hour C on that. And I, the reason I bring it up is because he's like, "Hey, make it make it available for PTs too." Or like, I don't think we can do all like I can't do all that, you know. Like we might as well just focus on chiropractors first, and then maybe expand later. Expand a little bit, yeah, yeah, good idea. Um, so back on, back on strength conditioning then with, um, is there any easy recommendations that, that you usually use and give to people? Um, cause I definitely have some, some of my own, but what you got trick. Uh, I, I think about tricking it, them into doing something. Yeah. I, I usually, tr- I'll trick them in the office. And, and just to basically let show them that they can do the things that they, they need to do in terms of personal training and strength and conditioning. Honestly, I, I kind of, I, I have a frank conversation with patients, uh, and just my, my personality, I, I guess when I, when I speak with patients, uh, I can, I'm not necessarily firm, but I'm also, you know, I, I I'm completely honest with them. You know, I tell them like, look, in terms of long-term, you know, benefit for you, it's not in my office. <laughs> it's not coming in here and let me work with you once a week or once a month, whatever you think you need. It's really getting with this person who can manage, uh, you know, manage this part of your, uh, your activity, uh, properly, you know, and if you have a good personal trainer and strength coach, then they're going to teach you also. And then hopefully they create in some independence in that way too, in the long run, if you have the right person. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, I, I always thought the the best way to prevent further problems is to squeeze the DMAC mac thym- thymometer. Yeah, that's that's, <laughs> that's tough, man. <laughs> Dent my thighs. Dent yeah. my yeah. thighs. Yeah, crush my thigh. Yeah. yeah, leave your fingerprints in my skin. <laughs> yeah, we will be breaking hands, man. That's not good. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I've been trying to trick a couple people into... Uh, the the people who like like the robotic movements like the mm-hmm. uh, they like the lifting I'll, I'll tell them to do something different do some like um, crawl around the ground act like an animal act like a kid things yeah. like that so some type of variability um, well I think I think you hit a, a kind of the Dan John principle right there right you basically if, if you want to improve performance or if you want to you want to help get people better you find a thing that they're not doing and you do it. And he uses the example of a strength conditioning for like a, a basketball team. You know, if you look at their program and they're, they're not doing carry, uh, they're not doing carries, you do carries and their performance improves. They get stronger, they jump higher, you know? So uh, you do that for the general population too. You, you take a step back and look at this person and this is for rehab and this is to start moving towards performance. Also, it's you know, what are they not doing? What are they doing too much of? What are they not doing? Let's, kind of move some of that attention away from what they're doing too much and move it more towards what they're not doing and things, things generally improve. Yeah. And I think a lot of times they'll tell you the things they, they are good at and they like. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and then when you yeah. further investigate, it's like, what are, what are you not good at? And, uh, yeah. let's work on that today. And then they hate you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're a part of that too, right? So, I mean, you know, the things that you're not very good at and you know, the things that you should be doing in your strength and conditioning, and if you don't do them, you feel fine. But when you do them, you feel better. Mm-hmm. Like for me, when I do long carries, not necessarily heavy carries, that's easy for me. It's just long duration carries. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. But man, I feel good. I, I, feel, and I, I, feel, I feel good for days after that too. You know, it, it's it's crazy. Are we talking briefcase or are we talking farmer? Farmers. Yeah. Oh, Farmers so you, carries. So you need a, a second kid. And yeah. make them yeah. heavy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I get just dynamic load carry up here and, you know. <laughs> oh, a mi- you're doing a mixed so, carry now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mixing up a little bit. But no, it, uh, not even like really heavy. Just kind of light, but just long, long carries. I feel great. Yeah. I feel great. You know, just to, just, just to recap on this too, I know that um, it's, it's sometimes it's easy to overlook. So, yeah, you carry a stroller. 
or are those what are they called? Bassinets, strollers? What are those? No, those aren't strollers. Car seat. Whatever the thing with the handle is. So that's that's a, that's a carry. How much do babies weigh? It depends. How much? How much does your baby weigh with that car seat? With the car seat, probably close to 25, 30 pounds. Do you carry a baby satchel backpack? Uh, I don't. Do you carry a fanny pack? I don't. No, we split the load. So oh. the wife will carry the bag, I'll carry the child. So I guess when you guys eventually travel and fly, are you still coming out here? On a, are you going to make that New Year's party? Yeah, that, that's that's the plan right now. So Okay, so you should take a video of you rolling your luggage, carrying a baby, pushing a stroller, and a well, backpack. The baby, would, the baby would be in the stroller. Well, you'd, you so. definitely have. A, you'd probably have a backpack you're, and a. You're trying to create too much variability <laughs> right now. Okay. Well, I would think it's funny. I think it's funny when people say they got hurt, like uh, yeah. carrying their luggage or putting the luggage in the overhead bin. Yeah. Practice on carrying something. Roll it. <laughs> Shit. Go to the grocery store instead of pushing the cart. Can you pull it sometimes or something? You know. Well, it's actually good. It's actually good. Yeah. But the problem is I've done that. It clips your Achilles. It doesn't doesn't work well for that. So. Pull it on the side with a fingertip pull. I do that, yeah. I'll push it on the side here, and I'll just guide it. Maybe if you walk a little, little bit more like a cartoon character with little scuffly steps, like that, that won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> or just, 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 uh, <laughs> just make noise when I walk. Eh, 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 eh. <laughs> kind of clear, clear room. Everybody, everybody separates. Oh, I thought you were talking about you'd breathe over someone's shoulder when you're in line waiting to pay. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know what we didn't do. We didn't, we didn't do the story at the beginning. Actually, I know. I'm actually kind of happy about it. You didn't start this thing off with some negativity. It's good, good <sighs> stuff. This is gonna be a good one. Well, no, no, no. I, no, we can't, no, we can't, we can't do it without. We got to do something. <laughs> uh, well, well, since you're the co-host, you can pose the question then. Yeah. What uh, What is something that you actually love to do, Seb? Mm. I like barbecuing. Tomahawk steaks. Tomahawk steaks. I knew you were gonna say that, baby. <laughs> you know. So what's so what so what's your what's your grill time on that? How long do you heat the the grill? What type of grill do you use? So um, I use the grill in my garage, which yep. has an infrared top. I don't know what that means. I think it was a sales point. I didn't buy propane? it. Propane. Propane. Uh, yeah. That's oh, that's propane. Yeah. So yeah. I do an indirect indirect sear, but I actually follow the hashtag Tomahawk on Instagram. It's one of the only two things. I follow, um, but so I'm surprised. So I'm lo- I'm looking peep at these people doing these massive like two two and a half pound steaks, right? And they just like they do it like caveman open fire style. I saw one dude throw it in the literally throw it in the ash, and he pulled it out and it looked phenomenal. But so I'm afraid to ruin a steak right now. But the reverse here, about 45 minutes, flip five minutes aside or so, keep it real yeah. low. By the way, yeah. the least manly way to make a tomahawk steak is with a meat thermometer. Terrible. So I won't. So well, you can you can take out the word tomahawk steak and just insert the word, the word steak. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so I got this friend who like he just got a new smoker and everything, and she showed me this app he can control with. I'm like, this is the least manly thing that you've ever showed me in your life. Um, <laughs> But but any but anyways, uh, after that we'll do a straight sear. But I saw people were flipping over their uh, cast iron skillets and throwing butter on there and doing the sear right on the flat surface. So I can't wait to do. It. We're gonna have we're gonna have tomahawks on New Year's. Yeah, yeah, it'll be good. It'll be a good day. Oh my god, good day. I can't wait. That's the best thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm so, so what do you like? Um, I actually um, so my. Uh, my mom, this past uh, uh, right before Thanksgiving, actually taught me how to make her gumbo. So I uh, I learned actually how to make gumbo, and it is awesome, and it's so fun. It's good. I love cooking. I love to cook, uh, and the roux takes so long. Uh, it takes so much attention and focus. It's uh it's pretty incredible. You have to you have to stir it constantly for anywhere from. 45 minutes to an hour and a half or longer. It kind of depends on how, how low the heat is or, and yeah, so it, it's awesome. So is there a secret family recipe that you got access to finally? There is, there is. Yeah, there is. Did, uh, what is roux? Is it the soup? No, the roux is the, is basically what makes the base of the, uh, um, uh, so you, so you, have you seen gumbo before? Um, I've seen, it's like a, it's like a soupy, 
So you, uh, see, you see how it's, how it's kind of dark? Wait, I thought that was that other thing where they throw all these sea creatures in there, and then when people eat them, they get really messy, and it's in this little cauldron. Um, no. I'm going to look up gumbo that. right now. Go ahead. So, no, so Rue, <laughs> the Rue is... The, <laughs> The rue is basically the base of the um, uh, what is what it, um, I don't know how to explain it. It look it kind of looks like uh, like a reddish like no. Okay, I'm gonna look at more images then. <laughs> you get the wrong thing. Put, put Louisiana it's, gumbo. It's like the sauce, yeah. Louisiana. Lou. Yeah. Lou. How you spell Louisiana? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a red sauce. It looks like you had it's not like. Rude. How what color is it? It's it's either brown or really really dark dark brown. I don't know, man. Looks pretty. Mm. Looks like looks like there's just a bunch of like shelled animals in a red sauce. Yeah, uh, that you are on the wrong <laughs> website, buddy. <laughs> anyway, I love cooking gumbo. So okay, I love gumbo and strength and conditioning. So when when uh you come over for New Year's. Do I need to go find all of these? Send me that recipe, and I'll go buy all the stuff, and you can cook gumbo. I'll I'll cook a tomahawk. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, anything you like to cover, strength conditioning wise? No, I think I think it's pretty straightforward uh, in terms of what we do in practice. Is is introduce people to the basics, uh, and and you know we may do some programming to introduce uh, kind of load to- uh, uh, tolerance to load uh, and empowerment create uh some uh you know patient independence and whatnot and then and transition them to with somebody who uh who you can communicate with that's very 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 important Mm -hmm. uh i would probably just add don't don't be afraid to add some weights to your patients um just make sure that you earn their trust and then go at their own pace but they're they're not fragile i don't i honestly don't think babies are fragile either neither pregnant mothers that's a whole different story but Uh, don't treat them like they're fragile because they'll also probably start adapting that principle. Um, That's true. And I think last thing on closing is then, uh, again, if you're interested, this is the release date for that book. So I literally wrote this thing for a damn year. Yeah, congrats, buddy. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. I So if you guys are interested, it's on Amazon. I put it in three different types of medias. There is an e-Kindle f- format, which if you like staring at the screen and burn your eyes, that's cool. That's your thing. Uh, there's print version, which I'd strongly suggest because there's written areas in there. And there's audio, so you can hear it like my sexy voice like this. But um, it's intended not for you guys to buy for yourself if you have a back problem. It's for you to buy for your damn spouse or your friend or your mom to give them the inertia nudge. And then hopefully the book will create a friction reduction. I like it. Good uh, stuff, man. Yeah, man. Uh, as, as always, it's good uh, co-hosting your show with you. Oh, yeah. This is, uh, this is so much easier and you have more to add. Well, what do you what do you want to talk bit. about next time? I don't know. Let's uh let's let's brainstorm there. Okay. It'll probably be a couple of weeks before you come on again then. Um Yeah. But we'll capture a picture gumbo and tomahawks. <laughs> a r- real <laughs> gumbo. I don't know what you're looking at. Awesome. All right. Good stuff, Seth. Cool. All right, everybody. Uh talk to you next week and um leave people better how you found them and always date an Eagle Scout. What do you got, Cody? Uh. <laughs> we'll close it on that he just like sank away from the mic see you guys next week <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>